Hey guys, welcome to the latest video for my Christian Faith class. Please feel free to post your comments or suggestions below. In this video we will be looking at two Protestant reformers. In the last video we looked at Martin Luther, so in this video we're going to look at these two scary guys. Before we begin, I'd like you to consider what these two things have in common. Sausage and tulips. Let's jump in. Let's take a look at Ulrich Zwingli, a Swiss reformer. He's important for a couple of reasons. He's important because of his interaction with Martin Luther, and we'll take a look at that. But he's also important for his understanding of the Eucharist, which is going to impact the low church traditions. And many church traditions, such as Baptists today, use that view. And it's very different from Martin Luther's view. So let's take a look at, first, his interaction with Martin Luther. If you want to know more about the Reformation, here's a great website. It's called Reformation Happens. The title here is Theological Perspectives of the Reformation. It's an important website written by a preeminent scholar. Yeah. Let's see how this works. You take a look at Luther, and you take a look at Zwingli, and now you can compare their timelines. You can see Luther is born in 1483. Zwingli is born a year after. So they're, at the same time, they're operating their Reformation programs in different areas. Luther in Germany, Zwingli in Switzerland. And we go to their most important meeting here at the Marburg Colloquy. All right, so you'll see that they draw up 15 articles. They agree on 14 of those, and then they reject. Uh, they can't get along on the idea of the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. Let's look at that in detail. Here's the Marburg Articles. We go down, there's pretty simple things that they agree on, baptism, good works, those sorts of things. But when we get to the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, they can't agree. So here are those folks who were there, Luther, Jonas, Melanchthon, Osiander, Zwingli, Booser are pretty important figures in the Reformation. Zwingli is a Swiss reformer, but he doesn't have all the princes on his side like Luther did. So he has to start the Reformation period in Zurich in a little bit of a different way. This is usually referred to as the Affair of the Sausages. In Lent of 1522, Zwingli decides to reenact the Lord's Supper in front of a print shop. There's a lot of irony and a lot of symbolism here going on. There are 12 men at the print shop printing the New Testament and they take a break and begin cooking sausage. Remember, this is during Lent, so everybody in Zurich smells the sausage cooking and they come to investigate and find out what's going on. So because Zurich is a Catholic city, it's ruled by those laws that the Catholic Church has drawn up. One of those is to refrain from eating meat during Lent. So the men are promptly arrested. That Sunday, Zwingli preaches a sermon in his church about whether or not persons should be free to eat meat during Lent. His argument is, if the Bible doesn't prohibit eating meat during Lent, then the church shouldn't, nor the city in which people live. So he's setting up this argument that the scriptures alone should judge what we do and determine what we do. And as a result of this famous sermon on the choice of freedom and foods, the town council gets together and decides that they will enact laws only according to scripture because of Zwingli's convincing sermon. 
Of course, Zwingli is best known for his understanding of the Eucharist. His understanding was radically different than the Catholic view and Luther's view. His view was that the Eucharist was merely symbolic, that the bread symbolized Jesus' body and the wine symbolized Jesus' blood. It didn't become Jesus' blood. It didn't become Jesus' body. It was simply a call for believers to remember what Jesus did on their behalf. As Corey pointed out, for Zwingli, the service is best understood as a remembrance or a memorial of what Jesus had done for believers. Similar to Luther, Zwingli also opposed the sale of indulgences, but he was a lot more radical than Luther in several ways. One, of course, is the Eucharist, but also his opposition to icons. He was similar to Luther's friend Karlstad in that regard. Next, we'll move on to the French reformer, John Calvin. He led the Reformation in Geneva. He's famous for his understanding of predestination, and particularly double predestination. Single predestination is the belief that God, single predestination is the belief that God elects some for salvation. Of course, those who are not elected for salvation are condemned to hell, but they're condemned because of their personal sin. Calvin holds to double predestination, however. It's the belief that God not only chooses those for salvation or elects those for salvation, God also elects the rest for damnation. This is an emphasis on the sovereignty of God and that God chooses persons for damnation and God chooses persons for salvation. Now on to tulips. To better grasp Calvin's theology, some later theologians developed the idea of the five points of Calvin's theology, and they developed it in a way that it could be remembered easily through the acrostic tulip. Now, Calvin didn't teach tulip. He didn't teach five points of theology. However, his theology can be summed up in this manner. But be careful. His theology is a lot more broad than these five points. First is total depravity. Calvin believed that our mind and will and our soul and all of who we are is depraved or touched by sin. So that means that we can't cry out to God, that we can't turn to God, because all of who we are, our totality, is depraved by sin to the extent that we can't reach out to God. Next is unconditional election. This is often difficult for students to grasp. Calvin is saying that if you are elected to be saved, it's not based on anything you do. It's unconditional. God doesn't see that persons are going to be good, therefore God elects them because they can't be good because of total depravity. Also, God doesn't look ahead and see that persons would respond to God, therefore they elect their elect because persons can't respond to God because of total depravity. Therefore, if you are elect of God, you can't brag about the fact that God has chosen you based on anything other than God's unconditional grace. Next is limited atonement. This is difficult to grasp if you don't understand Calvin's theory of the atonement. Now, atonement is that means by which God reconciles a sinner to God's self. Calvin held a theory of the atonement called penal substitution. The penal substitutionary theory of the atonement is based on Calvin's understanding of the law, much like Anselm's theory of the atonement was based on feudalism. Calvin believed that if one breaks the law, one must be punished. Therefore, because persons who are elect had broken the law, God must punish them. However, God sent Jesus to be punished on their behalf. Therefore, therefore, Jesus' suffering covers the death and penalty of the sins of the elect. However, Jesus didn't suffer for those who were not elect, because this is kind of a, an accounting transaction, right? It, Jesus will suffer for the amount of sins that one committed and not more, because if he suffered for 
sins beyond that, then that would cover somebody else's sin. So Jesus' death on the cross and his atonement is limited only to the elect. Next we have irresistible grace. This is a little strange to me, one of the strange aspects of the five points, because it states that if God has called you and has elected you to salvation, you cannot resist God's grace. Now my question would be, why would you want to resist God's grace and go to hell, right? It doesn't seem very logical. However, Calvin here is also trying to demonstrate the sovereignty of God. And so therefore, if God has chosen you, you will not resist God's grace, and you will receive salvation and live in eternity in heaven with God. The last of the five points is perseverance of the saints. Calvin believed that since God was sovereign and God chose persons for salvation, and this was not based on their performance or their goodness, that once God chose someone, that they were chosen forever. There was nothing that they could do to lose their salvation. This is his understanding of the perseverance of the saints.